Hello, Business 630 students. This is Professor Hasse and my last video of the summer of 2022. It's been a, an interesting ride these last eight weeks with uh, a variety of uh, family issues and traveling around the country, but I think we've got to the point of covering all our material. Just a couple final points uh, in this video today, and then we can wrap it up with the uh, Case number three, financial statement analysis due on Sunday, July 31st, and your grades posted next week. Uh, a couple of things about that case number three, then we had a video earlier in the week that reviewed it. Remember, this is a financial statement interpretation and ratio analysis. In other words, you're picking the co company that you selected way back in case number one, and finding two financial statements, March 31st, 2022, March 31st, 2021. You'll be finding four equa analytical equations from four financial analyst sections, profitability, asset management, liquidity, and debt management. You'll be calculating four equations for those two fiscal periods of time, quarter ending 22 and 21. Then once you do that, you're going to tell me your interpretation. Has the firm improved its performance? Is the firm in your interpretation manage efficiency? efficiency? It has to, is the potential investor, as a potential investor, would you buy stock in that company? I'm looking for that analytical answers in your PowerPoint. So two things in the PowerPoint. Show me the equations and the calculations for those four sections of financial analysis, and then in bullet points, your interpretation of that information. You can compare it to prior, uh, compare it to competitors or the industry average, but it's based on the financial data you provide, and that's what I want to see your analysis on. Remember, this is in a PowerPoint format. I have provided a sample of that format in the case three information in Blackboard. If I, again, I want to repeat, if you do not submit a PowerPoint file, you will get a zero on this case. So please pay attention to that. If you have any questions or concerns about your ability to do that, now's the time to let me know and I can help you this weekend. Okay. Now, one of the final aspects of this class is to talk about additional strategies to divide a capital management. And naturally, case number two in your spreadsheet of capital budget analysis is a key point. Case number three and case number one, where you're looking at the risk and the financial viability of an organization. But also there's some other material that you will not be assessed on, but will carry forward into your 696 class, which you'll take as the final course in your MBA study. And this information will help you immensely in that. I have provided you in week seven, two articles, strategy without disrupting your organization and measures that drive performance. This is a lead in to your 696 class understanding and read those articles and have that understanding or refer back to them when you do take that 696 class. Those articles are excellent. That'll help you in that final class to summarize your MBA studies. Strategies that disrupt your organization. I'm sure all of you have been involved in some type of business or even family matters where a change in strategy, a change in direction affects the organization or affects your family, good or bad. How does that, how can you do that without distracting your organization? That's what that article is about. And the second article is measures that drive performance. A lot of us are, uh, are uh, concerned about or have studied the SWOT analysis. The SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, a key measure, a key way of analyzing a company. But this talks about a second area of measuring the drive, measuring performance and efficiency of an organization. The balanced scorecard approach talked about in that measures that drive performance article. In addition to SWOT, uh, what is called the balanced scorecard approach to analyzing the efficiency of an organization. Some of you, some of you might even use it in your companies today. 
I want you to read about that because that's going to be one of the measurements that you use in that 696 class. Other alternatives to deciding are you doing things right within your organization. And another key aspect of additional strategies are mergers and acquisitions. Part of all our class has been about investing in assets that create maximum maximization of value. But also there's other ways of going about to maximize value and that's acquiring or merging with rival companies. You have your horizontal mergers, your vertical mergers, your conglomerate mergers, all different types. Here's a nice video that explains that type of strategy. This video segment discusses mergers and acquisitions in the context of strategic management. Merger and acquisition activity is extremely important in strategic management as we continue to see larger and larger deals in front of us. One of the more recent in the acquisition area is that of Google's proposed acquisition of the Motorola cell phone business for $12.5 billion. This signals Google's desire to further diversify away from its search engine business into an area it thinks has great potential for profits. It's instructive to differentiate between merger and acquisitions because they are quite different. In a merger, what you'll have is two firms of somewhat similar size that just combine their assets and their names typically become combined as well. You may recall the failed merger some dozen years ago between Daimler and Chrysler. Their names uh, became merged. Acquisitions are quite different. This is a situation where you find a larger or more cash rich firm buying a smaller organization. The smaller organization then comes uh, the subsidiary of the larger organization. If the Motorola acquisition goes through, Motorola will, will become a subsidiary of Google. In the not too distant past, Kraft paid $20 billion to purchase Cadbury. Kraft is a uh, United States convenience food manufacturer and Cadbury is a confectioner into chocolates and chewing gum and they are located in the United Kingdom. Kraft paid almost 20 billion dollars to purchase all the assets of Cadbury. In the business press we quite often see merger and acquisition activity discussed interchangeably but these terms mean something very different as you can see from this and uh, from the slide as well. In the situation of mergers you have a situation where either the names become combined or one of the parents may become the dominant player and they're simply named after uh, the larger or the more dominant organization which comes through in a merger. One of the parents, regardless of how their name changes or does not change, usually uh, emerges as the dominant management team. I don't know what the case in Sirius XM Radio is, but I do know that Daimler, a, a German company, became the dominant management team of Daimler Chrysler some years ago. In acquisitions, you have a situation where the acquire or, which was Kraft Foods in, the, in this case of a Cadbury, just buys out all the firm's stock. So they bought all of Cadbury stock for uh, nearly $20 billion. And these types of uh, activities can be either friendly or hostile uh, for the acquiree. There are several types of merger and acquisition activity, and I'm going to detail five. Vertical activity in mergers and acquisitions could be simply to buy a supplier or customer. So they're vertically going forward or backward to streamline their cost structure. And Johnson & Johnson acquired some time ago Mentor, which is a latex glove company, among other things, to, to complement its products to become a supplier to other divisions of Johnson & Johnson, hence streamlining its cost structure. In the case of horizontal merger and acquisition activity, we see a situation where you merge or acquire a competitor and we've seen that in the recent past in so much is that the um, uh, Dutch firm InBev bought out Anheuser-Busch thus reducing their competition to some extent. Product extension is a situation where you're buying complementary products or acquiring them to fit your 
portfolio. And in this case, Kraft's acquisition of Cadbury is a perfect example of complementary products. It also exemplifies market extension, which is where you want to go into different markets. Uh, if you studied the Cadbury Kraft acquisition, probably the main reason that Kraft wanted Cadbury so badly is that Cadbury does very, very well in some emerging markets where Kraft does not do very well. Uh, and namely, those two markets are India and Brazil. Cadbury does very, very well there. Kraft has had minimal success and hopes to piggyback off Cadbury's uh, leverage in those two large emerging economies um, for Kraft to do well. And that's market extension. And then there's also a, this unrelated firm of merger and acquisition activity. We call it conglomerate merger and acquisition activity. And this is a constant strategy that General Electric undergoes. General Electric, if you look at their um, their web page or their annual report, they are into uh, a wide host of products from light bulbs to appliances to jet engines uh, to you know medical imaging products in the uh, healthcare industry and, all, and, and many more industries as well. So it buys firms that are uh, quite different. But um, at the same time, it diversifies their way of their uh, total risk by being involved in a lot of different industries. The logic behind this related merger and acquisition activity, when you buy something that's related or you merge two firms that are related, what you hope is that you have value creation. And that is what's hoped from the you know the, the uh, merger between Sirius and XM. They need to create value because both firms were losing money. And we examine this when talking about the value chain. Uh, part of that value creation is going to come from cost reductions, hopefully through economies of scale or a larger new satellite radio organization being the new merged company. And also another value creating activity we see called economies of scope. And that is situations where firms can share competencies. And really this goes back to the value chain as well. They can share branding, name, content, uh, subscribers, etc. There are some implementation issues in mergers and acquisition activity. And, you know, no better illustrated than in the case of Daimler and Chrysler. And that's in cultural differences. A German organization merging with a US organization. Merger and ac acquisition activity always requires the merging of two different cultures, whether they be from two different countries or from the same country, you're still going to have two different and often quite uh, disparate organizational cultures. That was a big problem for Daimler and Chrysler. Cultural merging involves a number of things. It, among other things, it involves the combination of elements of two different cultures, management styles, products, customers, etc. It's interesting to see what's going to happen if the Google acquisition of Motorola happens and the Kraft acquisition of Cadbury as of the speaking of late 2011 is already complete and we still have not seen yet the full effect of the combination of both uh, both cultures. We do know in the case of uh, uh, Kraft that Cadbury has fought this over in the United Kingdom Kingdom because they're not happy about an American company buying out their their company and s many are unsure about their stability uh, as an organization going forward thinking Kraft might take the chocolate company and move it back to the United States. So it's difficult, costly, um, and, and it's not always possible to pull off a merger and acquisition from the implementation side. One last thing I'll say is that merger and acquisition activity is, is kind of risky, uh, but it's especially risky in the international uh, side. Research shows that 70% of all mergers or acquisitions that take place between firms from different countries are going to fail. So if you think about that, uh, your odds of making a merger or acquisition work when you have headquarters from two separate countries, your odds are not very good. So yes, mergers and acquisitions are another way of acquiring capital and maintaining your business model. Another way of doing that also is, for lack of a better term, bankruptcy. By restructuring your company through Chapter 11, uh, not Chapter 7, which is liquidation, but restructuring by tra tra Chapter 11, restructuring your business to get rid of and uh, get some leniency on old debt, and then at the same time restructuring your company. 
Another source of capital is leasing. Instead of purchasing an asset, lease an asset. Yes, you lose many tax advantage, but for the small businessman and small businesswoman, leasing is a way of acquiring assets without the risk of credit problems or the leverage of borrowing money. As you know, a lot of us in Southern California have to rent apartments. Why? Because we can't afford the purchase of an asset like a house. Many of us can't afford to purchase an automobile. So what some of us do, we lease an automobile. We still get the use of a nice roof over our heads or the use of a car without any disruption in our credit or any interest or uh, leverage payments over a course of time. Companies are the same thing, leasing of assets. But naturally, the larger a company gets, the more it grows, those tax advantages from owning assets will be of more of advantage than the lease. But for small businesses, leasing is quite the advantage. So there's a lot of other different strategies involved in corporate finance besides just going out, borrowing money, issuing equity, or in investing in assets, making a return, paying off your investors, keeping a, a breast of your competition and your market share, and continuing on with your business model. There's other ways, mergers, acquisitions, leverage buyouts, using debt to buy out the equity of a company, lease versus purchasing. And there's other strategies involved as the balance scorecard of balancing out all the pros and cons of strategic decisions. So study these in this last week or going after our class. I will leave this Blackboard open until 2024. So you have access to all this information, especially for that 696 class as you complete your MBA study. But also more importantly, you now have me in your network. You can call on me if you have any questions or concerns about your career. Some of you may need letters of recommendation. I have found that having a couple of letters of recommendation from professors in your studies adds a lot of benefit to your internal vita or your personnel file. Having a couple of professors talk about what you studied with them, how well you did is very important. So if any of you need or would like letters of recommendation in the future, please feel free to drop me an email and I'll be more than happy to do that for you. But also this Blackboard and the YouTube will be available for you into the future to use as reference for other courses or even career or professional use in your, uh, in your MBA or business studies. So please take advantage of that. The task at hand is to get that case number three done this weekend. I'll be around if you have any questions. If you want to schedule a Zoom and go over something, that's okay. If you have any hesitations or don't understand what I'm looking for in the PowerPoint file, please let me know and I'll be available for any questions. Remember, the case number three PowerPoint file is to show me your ability to interpret financial information four ways, interpret what it tells you about a company in relationship to trends in the business, trends in the economy, trends in their industry that they're in, and how you put that together. You are not going to use this file as an active presentation. It's just a file that shows me that you can do this analysis in a different type of format. Okay, everybody, it's been an honor and a pleasure to meet with all of you and to work with you this summer of 2022. I think one of the interesting things in the, in the um, pro or con things about this is that you uh, are learning different strategies about corporate finance. Now, also, I please encourage you to uh, complete the course evaluation. It has no effect on your grade. It's anonymous, but it's a good feedback for myself and for the powers that be at the university about, are you getting value out of this study? I will put a link in with my email to you in introducing this video. I'll put a link to the course evaluations should you need it. I'll be around all weekend. Look forward to hearing from you if you need me. Again, thank you very much for your excellent work this summer, and I wish you much, much success down the road. Take care.